economic history revised and reshaped Rostow's economic history. Interest in economic matters was kept high by the turbulent prosperity of the 1920s, the Great Depression of the 1930s, the rebuilding of the economic machinery of parts of Europe after 1945, the problems of economic development in the Third World, and the affluent 1960s and 1970s, when the Gross National Product, or GNP, finally became the index of collective happiness. Why then did economic history play so small a role? Slowness to adjust on the part of historians was a less important factor than the contemporary conviction that economic well-being could best be assured by eco economics interpreted as technology. In the Soviet Union, for example, economic history had theoretically ended with the arrival of the ultimate mode of production and its corresponding communist society. The new and permanent society needed only economic technology. In the West, neoclassicists John Maynard Keynes and the Keynesians and monetarists and other the uh, uh, theoreticians studied every economy as a self-contained system whose working was determined by universal and timelessly valid forces and patterns. Its analysis must proceed mathematically, be based on data with a short range in time, and be concerned essentially with remedying any disturbance in the equilibrium and with the desirable growth of the GNP. The historical perspective held little attraction, since in the absence of trust in genetic explanations, the forces at work in any but the recent period of the past were considered irrelevant for the present-day situation. Also, due to the lack of sufficient data, most past economic activities could not be studied exactly enough for the formulation of valid generalizations. The historical perspective found its main refuge in the analysis of economic change, such as the study of business cycles and in the quasi-biographical studies of entrepreneurs. <coughs> Made homeless in economics, economic historians went their own way, pursuing their interests and practicing their trade in a quieter corner of academic history. While theoretical economists were successful in persuading influential persons that their insights could help substantially in mastering the complexity of the industrial economy, Economic historians, for their part, continued along the lines laid out by the pioneers of the late 19th century and early 20th century, but many of them withdrew more deeply into their studies and dropped their concern for social activism, reduced the scope of their analysis from general economic evolution to short and medium-range changes, became less concerned with interrelationships between various institutions, and did fewer comparative studies. After the year 1918, traditional studies of economic institutions in medieval history came from disciples of Karl von and Nama Sternig's Austrian school, among them Alphonse Dopsk. The later, Aldolf Alphonse, tried to shed light on landholding patterns, manorialism, serfdom, and the village. And economic development still perceived as a sequence of early defined stages, two transitional periods held a special fascination for continental scholars. One was the transition from Naturwirtschaft, an agrarian economy with the barter system, and Geldwirtschaft, a commercial economy based on money, capital, and entrepreneurs. The other transition, the one from the ancient to the medieval period, was studied by the famous Belgian economic historian Henry Pirny, or Pyrene who made a good case for a continuity between the ancient and early medieval economies. Not the German migrations, but the Saracen conquests broke that continuity, a fact which made Carolingian Europe the beginning of a new historical period. In England, the United States, in works of traditional scrupulous scholarship, the old guard of economic history, dominated the scene until about 1960. In the United States, pride in the role of American business in the building of the Republic led to the flourishing of business history. At the turn of the century, Edwin F. Gay of Harvard University wrote and taught an institutional version of his history. From that came, after 1918, both Norman S. B. Graz's business history, emphasizing entrepreneurship and how it functioned in the American context, and Arthur H. Cole's entrepreneurial history, 
which embedded business even more securely in the wider framework of American life. Institutional theories of economics continued in many ways the ideas and concerns of traditional English and German economic historians and of Veblen, but the institutionalists who gave considerably more weight to historical approaches than to timeless universal and pure market eco uh, models for the, of the economy neither turned their backs completely on the prevailing economic theory nor accepted Veblen's vision of a collapse of capitalism. From John R. Commons to John K. Galbraith, they were heavily involved in redefining capitalism, whether as reasonable capitalism or lately as guided capitalism. Some of the concerns and ideas of institutional economists penetrated into the new history and its continuation, progressive history. None had a greater impact than Veblen's dichotomy that divided industry and common people from business. It thrived in the 1920s when economic history was drawn into the public discussion of America's role in the Great War, and the issue was reduced to the simplistic question of whether munition makers and eastern bankers had tricked their country into getting involved in the war for their own selfish purposes. Charles and Mary Beard's popular work called The Rise of American Civilization argued in general for the prominence of economic forces in human life and gave the thesis of a conflict between American society that of the people, and business as a place of honor. Even the Civil War's importance lay not in the demise of slavery, but in being an important phase in the Second American Revolution in which the capitalists, laborers, and farmers of the North and West defeated the planters of the agrarian South. Of course, as we know, that was far from the case. The war's outcome gave the dominant role in the United States ultimately to business, the many subsequent studies of the Civil War, however, in the economic vein, by no means all adhered to that master scheme. Even historians of an economic bent produced more thorough and comparative analysis of northern and southern prosperity, distribution of wealth, and labor systems. Charles Beard himself emphasized in his later years that he always spoke of economic motives and influences, never of economic determinism. Yet prior to the 1930s, he spoke so forcefully and with so few qualifications that his many partisans, though they had a mandate for a rigid economic interpretation, a view which the economic struggles of the Depression era reinforced. The series of studies in economic history in the Beardian spirit faded only in the late 1940s. French economic history, like so much of French history, had a prime focus on the revolution. In the years after 1871, the Third Republic's quasi-official interpretation of the French Revolution had emerged. It portrayed the revolution as the decisive step in the coming to power of the Third Estate, the social group which constituted the main buttress of the Republic. According to Alphonse Aulard, that process of emancipation conformed to the logic of history despite such unfortunate aberrations as the rule of terror. Napoleon and the repressive regimes between 1815 and 1830, and from 1848 to 1871. Not everyone agreed. Taine considered the whole revolution misguided, since it affirmed radical change pattern after abstract ideals. Instead, the French should have resolved their social issues through gradual changes in the English banner. But the most severe challenge to the consensus view of the French Revolution came from those who engaged in the economic interpretation of the past. For that interpretation, it did not suffice that one spoke like Taine of the poverty of the peasants, unless one gave that fact sufficient weight. Marx and the Marxists finally shifted the accent decisively from politics to economics. In the early 1900s, Jean Jaurès held that the French Revolution was the first necessary adjustment of social and political institutions to the new industrial mode of production. The rule by the aristocracy had become anach anachronistic and that by the bourgeoisie appropriate. The laboring class had failed to gain from that revolution because class consciousness among workers had still been weak. Therefore, the identity of the exploiting class had changed, but not that of the exploited class. This simple orthodox Marxist scheme did not endure for long. Closer scrutiny showed significant differences within social groups, which weakened the class argument. George Lefebvre argued urged scholars to take into account the many levels of income and property instead of using a simple scheme that pitted the poor against the wealthy, that is, two large, uniform classes against each other. See Ernest Labrousse's careful 
attribution of dominant causal roles to the economic recession of 1778 to 1789. Troubled state finances and high bread prices impressed many, although critics ascribed to them only a triggering role. Orthodox Marxist view of the French Revolution acquired new critics when, under the influence of psychology, studies of mass behavior like Lefebvre's The Great Fear modified purely economic interpretations. In recent studies, the uh, sensculottes were shown to have had more the character of a temporary alliance between diverse groups than that of a real class. A whole group of scholars, among them Alfred Coban, continue to demonstrate in their works how complex a phenomenon and how distant from simple schemes the French Revolution actually was. Explanations based on economic determinism have fared ill, not only in studies of the French Revolution. Since the year 1945, the Annals scholars have produced sophisticated economic interpretations but have held fast to the ideal of a total history with no one dominant force. Their economic histories have been portraits of the economic life in certain periods, unattached to any grand scheme of development. Rather than look for a fixed schemata, the Annals scholars have widened the base on which economic history is built by seeking out new sources, such as administrative records and documents in private and legal archives. They wish to mirror the actual and not the intended life, fulfilled well in George Dubey's Rural Economy and Country Life in the Medieval West, published in 1962, made them go far beyond the traditional study of official rules, regulations, and characters. That led them away from the typology of German economic history, as well as from the rigid Marxist schemes and toward detailed studies of past economic life. This attitude was shared particularly by scholars who have studied the economic history of early modern Europe with its price revolution, commercial development, and rise of capitalism. The Cleometricians During the years following 1945, when the spirit of technology triumphed not only in industry but also in intellectual endeavors, Economic history experienced attempts to bring it in line with the age. Of this spirit was born the new economic history, which in essence wished to make economic history a science in the natural science manner. No longer were economic historians to describe or explain particular phenomena. Instead, they must deal with categories of events involving aggregates and group behavior. All analysis must be quantitative and have as its model not the messy world of experience with its multitude of interrelated phenomena, but a manageable, systematic world. The key tool of analysis were ecometric models, <clears throat> econometric models which tested and expressed economic phenomena in mathematical form. In order to do this successfully, scholars dealt with models containing relatively few variables. The best known examples of their methodological repertoire have been the so-called counterfactual hypotheses. Robert W. Fogel, tested a widely accepted thesis when he asked whether the railroads were really the central feature in American development. He designed a model of the 19th century United States without railroads and found that America's development would not have changed much since alternative methods of transportation would have taken over. Fogel's work has remained the standard example for the counterfactual conditional concept, which establishes and measures what could have happened in order to understand what actually did happen. Nevertheless, Many historians have remained skeptical. If important features of the past did not matter all that much, where did that leave causal necessity? In the specific case, would every aspect of American life really have stayed the same without railroads? Would, could, or would one ever cut out the railroads and their impact in so clean a manner from the American context? Cliometricians also tackled a more controversial issue, slavery as an economic institution in the antebellum South. Again, the antebellum period was that period between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. The cliometricians asked whether it indeed was, as most historians have maintained, moribund, unprofitable, inefficient in labor use, a drag on the South, and a producer of a harsh life. First, John R. Mayer and Alfred H. Conrad, and then Robert W. Fogel and Stanley L. Ingerman, in their Time on the Cross, published in 1974, said no although they personally found slavery abhorrent. Particularly, the latter work led to extensive discussions on the theoretical foundations and the possibilities, as well as limitations, of cliometrics. Critics have not only questioned the reliability and selection of the data, but often overlooking the 
qual- qualifying su- subtitle of Fogel and Ingerman's book, The Economics of American Negro Slavery, also have asked to what degree statistical correlations, equations, and adherence to strictly theoretical concepts in a pure economic reality could ever encompass human reality, especially its moral aspect and domain. Although the authors would state that the latter consideration was outside of the economic realm, the wider question remains unanswered of whether the new economic history, with its narrow theoretical base, would ever be able to create a synthetic interpretation of even economic reality. The theoretical world in which market forces and totally rational human beings operate without friction is located at a long distance from the actual world in which societal rules and customs as well as complex human motivations interfere heavily in economic phenomena. Reservations along that line have accounted for a reluctance by historians, including those of the French Annals Group, to accept the cliometric model. The Annals' idea of a total history did not fit well with the ideals of a cliometric approach, and Annals scholars, especially Pierre Chanel, preferred the model of serial history and the ascertaining of trends, conjunctures. This approach continues in the French tradition begun by Francois Simeon in the 1920s and 1930s, one in which quantification of economic data is ancillary and not primary. Once many series have been constructed, it may be well possible to construct a total model. Only a few French economic historians have joined the new economic historians. A return to stages of economic development. In recent years, a significant rapprochement between economic theory and history has occurred in the studies of economic development, after the year 1945, the Western economies had started, had startled everyone by their robust growth. Marxists pondered the reasons for this growth, given the expected demise of capitalism, while others linked democracy causally with the efficiency, productivity, and ability to grow of a free enterprise economy. But an even more intense debate on economic development was spurred by the contrast between the industrialized nations on the one side and a large number of stagnant economies around the entire globe. The question arose whether and how all economies of the world could or would reach the economic maturity of the West, the Soviet Union, and Japan. These discussions redirected attention to the problem of long-range economic development, a problem which by its very nature is historical. It has been assumed generally that the process of industrialization formed a universal pattern that would be repeated by every nation. In the 1960s, the search for that pattern intensified, and since even a highly abstract universal model needed to be based or tested on a vast body of historical data, the historical dimension of the whole endeavor was undeniable. Indeed, the concept of stages in economic development, embedded in 19th century German economic history and in that of Karl Marx, experienced a revival. One spoke of stages, transitional periods, and dynamic forces. With the Marxist model still prominent, Walter W. Rostow suggested an alternative with a capitalist perspective, a six-stage model. And first you have in Rostow's typical stages, you have uh, six stages and it's in the six-stage model. It's the first is traditional society and economy. The second is traditional transitional society and economy. The third is a takeoff stage. The fourth is a maturity society. The fifth is a stage of mass consumption, and the sixth is where it goes beyond mass consumption. But critics have questioned various elements in Rostow's theory, yet in the process they too had to deal with the historical dimension of economic activities and have thereby done their share in invigorating economic history. The latter had already derived much strength from the rise to prominence of social history, which, as will be seen, incorporated a keen interest in how people earned their living and how economic power relationships shaped society itself.